right, hello and welcome to the Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golan from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, joining you from a beautiful San Diego morning. Uh, but one thing I can honestly say about San Diego is that uh, the Padres are not in the World Series, unlike Rob Jollis, who is joining me from the D.C. area and proudly sporting his Washington National shirt. <laughs> as they are now. We were on pins and needles here in D.C., but uh, yes, <laughs> forget all the other political stuff. This is what's really mattering right now in the Washington, <laughs> D.C. area. And, and Rob, as most of you know, is a well-known speaker, author, um, uh, consultant around sales. And what we're going to talk today about is this idea of customer decision cycles. So, um, Rob, when you, mention, when you say customer decision cycles, what do you mean by that? Well, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, we hear all about sales ideas. Let's go for sales ideas. Give me another sales idea. I, I do a lot in the financial industry. I can't walk down a hallway without somebody leaning out going, hey, give me a sales idea. <laughs> and one of the best sales ideas I can give you is, well, why don't you study the way your clients make decisions uh, Look at and start there. I mean, imagine if before we opened our mouth, the first question we asked was, well, where's the customer? Where's the client? Where is this prospect? Mm -hmm. And what we've got to do in this conversation is prove that they actually go through very repeatable decision points. Three points, three, six stages. We can track them. If we can prove that in 15 minutes, how could that not be incredibly valuable for a salesperson? Yeah, it always seems to me that we become, I have to say, I think we become a little complacent and we make a lot of assumptions. Uh, and I think sometimes we assume that we know how our customers make decisions and all of that, but we probably haven't studied it any time recently. We're probably basing it off experiences from maybe a long time ago. And as we know, uh, customer buying habits are, are dynamic, right? Yeah, yeah. And the funny thing is, once you look at how customers make decisions, it completely changes really the way you even define selling because we've maybe talked about this before, but everybody wants to define selling as listening to customers and mm -hmm. taking customer needs and linking needs to benefits. And that's wonderful, kind of a needs-based selling, um, kumbaya. Uh, you know, it's, it's lovely. The problem is once you study the way customers make decisions, you realize they don't even make decisions on, based on needs anyway. It all starts as a problem. And that's one of the things we learn in this cycle. Mm -hmm. And th therefore, but to obviously do that, then one of the first things you have to do is actually have a conversation with even, with new customers, existing customers, and really and ask them to walk you through their process. Yeah, you know, I was going to title a book that once, The Value of a Good Conversation. That, that was the <laughs> title of the book. Publisher didn't like it, but still kind of gnaws at me because mm -hmm. isn't that the bottom line? Isn't that what we're going to talk about today? You'll talk about it tomorrow and for the rest of the week. We have to create a valuable conversation with this customer and understanding the cycles that they go through is a, clearly a major part of that. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, I mean, nowadays, especially in B2B selling, right, there's, there's rarely just one person involved on the buyer side. There's a T and there's people with varying levels of influence. So not only do you have to understand, you have to understand all those, how all those people are involved, but you've got to understand about what point of these, this cycle or process each of them comes in and what role they play at that point. Yeah, you know, I'm still kind of old school in terms of end user, that's the Xeroid, the Xerox guy mm -hmm. me talking, <laughs> but decision influencer, decision maker. But yet the company is still on a cycle um, mm -hmm. and you know, we'll go over that. Yeah, so let's talk about what are some of the, what are some of the customer decision cycles? All right, grab yourself a cup of coffee. I'm going to take it from here for a minute, okay? Okay, I'll be All back. right. <laughs> okay. six, six stages and then back me up and we'll slow down. Yeah. But let's just, let's just nail those right off the bat. There is a satisfied stage. That's where the customer is just completely 100% happy. Not a great position to find us, ourselves mm -hmm. in selling, but what if I told you 20 years we've been, we've been monitoring this and we're seeing about 45 to 5% of the population truly satisfied in any given area. And I can't prove it statistically, but I'm one who firmly believes half that 5% do have a problem, they just don't know about it. But that's right. not the one we have to worry about. We have to worry about stage two. That's called the acknowledge stage. Now, not everybody hands that to us when we're walking in the door, but that's where the customer looks you in the eye and says, you know, in fact, that's why I wanted to have the conversation. Um, we're not 
hundred percent happy with the way we're doing bang. Um, but we're not really committed to making a change there yet. So in a sense, what the customer is telling you is I brought you in to whine about this a little bit mm -hmm. and see if you'll jump way forward and fix it for me, which then mm -hmm. I'll think about or, or I'll object on price. But that acknowledge stage is kind of a whining, moaning, complaining stage. And let's keep the salesperson out of it for a moment. The third stage is where they actually come across their first decision point and say, you know what? Maybe maybe it's a car. Maybe I dropped my transmission. I, I have a $4,000 bill for a water pump, whatever. I, I, I'm going to get rid of this car. And that's where the needs come in. And so now they're in stage three. They're in their criteria. They're thinking, well, what do I need to do? What does our business need? We need to prove this and prove that. It's usually a direct reflection right. off the problems. So in fact, they're trying. What, what is it they're trying to solve? Then mm -hmm. they step four and I'll hustle. They investigate, they basically take this list. That's where a vendor gets called. The good news is we got a call. Bad news is you're not the only call that they're yeah. making. So we like mm -hmm. to get in earlier, but they investigate. Step five is they select, bang, basically pull in the trigger. But step six is they will reconsider. They'll go through that buyer's remorse. And mm -hmm. when you follow that pattern and really focus in on the acknowledge stage where all the action's at, you begin to understand how to implement the tactics that you've been taught. So what, what do salespeople hate about sales training? Ah, it's, it's a straitjacket. We're going through yeah. step by step by step. Well, when you look at people, the way people make decisions and you say to yourself, okay, where's the customer? Maybe even step four. You see, I don't need those first couple steps. Now I can shape the shot a bit, but I'll pause and just let, let's let that lay. Those are the six steps that a customer goes through. Yeah, and and obviously the the work that you do in some of those steps mitigates for some of the other ones later, right? I mean, there's there's obviously there's the reconsideration and maybe motivation dip at the end or the fear of oh, am I going to pull the trigger on this? But if you can revisit the earlier part where you were where you were actually you know helping them to see the future with this problem solved, then you can hopefully overcome that. Oh, absolutely. And just look at the first two stages. Nothing happens without trust. So we mm -hmm. got to start there. And you and I have talked about, and I'm not the only person to talk about, we might want to keep our questions open, might <laughs> want to just lay off the problem, mm -hmm. let the customer talk. The more they talk, the more they're going to like you. Uh, but begin with the end in mind, where are we going? But that second stage, what if I told you 79% of the population is typically hunkered down somewhere in the acknowledge stage? Well, then that becomes a huge selling stage, doesn't it? And that's where we have to not solve problems yet, but study problems. In other words, mm -hmm. the customer is giving you almost a blessing of saying, here's what our issue is. Don't fix it yet. Study it. Ask more. Go deeper. Go deeper. Because the one trial close that no salespeople typically uses, okay, and when you study the first decision point, it makes complete sense is, do you want to fix this? Yeah. I, I can't wait to get the features and benefits and I have yeah. my closing tactics and you should see me handle objections. But by golly, by gosh, that's the first decision point. And the more and deeper we study the problem and the bigger the potential that problem becomes in the customer's mind, the easier the answer to the question is of, do you want to fix it? Are you committed to making a change? Yeah. Is Once we get them over that, then things get easier. And I think that's a really important point to underline because sometimes it's, uh, you know, just in, in, in enthusiasm or the, you know, the want to get something moving on the first time, you know, you hear a problem articulated, you think, fantastic, I can fix this problem. You dive into it. But as you say, it has to be a problem that they want to fix or that you can show them the magnitude of not fixing it. Because let's face it, there's a lot of problems we're happy to whine about as you talk, we're happy to talk about, but we've got zero intention of fixing them. Exactly. And, you know, and, and, and if we do, if we drag the customer across that line, so they have a mild problem, they may have, you know, the funny thing is I always want to ask a customer nicely, if, if you were that smart, how come you haven't fixed it already? Uh, you know, how long have you had this? Don't be surprised to hear a client say, uh, you know, two years. Oh, yeah. well, then I'll hit you with features and benefits. That's going to fix it. 
No, mm -hmm. we, we don't have to wait for that transmission to go. We don't have to wait for the company to be, to lose its key customer, to lose, lose a key employee, to, to you know, really have a, 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 a downfall of some sort, to at least talk about it. Because that's one of the things that, that very important to me, which is I wish salespeople would understand how vital they are to the world, to society. Sure. Because mm -hmm. we, we have, if we have to use our tactics properly, we have the ability to solve, help customers get over their fear of change, solve problems before they become big problems. Once it's a big problem, we don't need a genius salesperson anymore. Okay, <laughs> now it'll be, it costs the customer. So if we believe in our solution, and then what, what are we afraid of? Why can't we ask more questions? Sometimes, well, what happens if it does occur this way? What mm -hmm. if you do lose that customer? Let the client think about that because now we're moving to get them to say, you know, maybe it is worthwhile looking at alternatives. <laughs> well, yeah. there you go, okay? So every time you get hit with a price objection, every time you get hit with an objection of, let me think about it, what you're really hearing is, I'm not really committed to solving this problem, yeah. and you keep showing me how to fix it. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, and exactly as you say, uh, and you know, and sometimes you'll go through that process and it'll turn out that the problem isn't something worth fixing, but it also gives you the opportunity be, you know, to, as you say, to be in a conversation and be on a journey with the customer, like exploring this as opposed to sort of trying to pitch across the table. You're both exploring this, right? Yeah. Well Together. said, well said, remember. We're supposed to be consultants. We're supposed to be problem solvers. Well, guess what happens when the customer's in the acknowledge stage thinking about fixing a problem, and we say, tell me more about that issue. We're mm -hmm. problem solving. That's what fishbone analysis is. We all learned that mm -hmm. and tried to get it out of our head from school, but fishbone analysis and those types of tools uh, really taught us to, to almost act like a two-year-old and keep asking, because why? Because yeah. why? <laughs> because we do it that way. Well, because why? Well, because we really can't do it that way. Well, because why? Keep following the problem and you won't have to worry about getting blindsided by a price objection. Uh, mm -hmm. You will solve it there. Yeah. And, and as, you, as you were saying, like from that uh, dialogue, you may, it may uh, bring you to a point where they say, oh, this is absolutely, we have to fix this. Or it may bring you to a point where you uncover that there's a huge roadblock that's out of, out of the hands of the person you're talking to, and therefore you can pivot to something else. Bingo. Perfect. That's what decision points are. Decision points are, are places where we can take a temperature read. So if I, if I think, well, I'm really going deep into John's problem and issues here, and oh boy, this is really big in my mind. <laughs> okay, well, do you think it's worthwhile looking at other ideas? Not really. <laughs> okay, not the end of the world. That's an objection. Let's mm -hmm. clarify it now. Let's get to the bottom of this. Maybe we're not talking to the decision maker. Maybe they yeah. only said they were. But let's flush out objections. Maybe this, won't, this isn't a potential prospect. How many times have we committed time, resources, yeah. personnel to customers and situations that not only don't buy, they would never buy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why decision points are there, and that's why we pair up trial closes for each decision point. Yeah, and I think that's a Im really important one because there's nothing worse than and, and you're getting stuck in continuous cycles of, of a, a non-deal right and investing more and more time and being like that you know being like that per person in in vegas where well you know they're at the airport they're leaving vegas and they're still at the slot machine giving yeah. it one more go trying to trying to make back all the money they've lost yeah. i hear the numbers in the airports are really good there by the way <laughs> but it's just a rumor i've heard maybe it's true but but yeah you know we we always talk about um you know in selling uh, you know our job is to sort of that take that idea and put it in the customer's brain. Make them feel like they mm -hmm. thought of it. Well, do you understand the, the latitude we have if we stay off the solution and we sit there, pair up to that acknowledge stage and drill down on problems that we fix well? Yeah. You see? Uh, now, uh, and again, I'm not trying to manipulate the client. I'm just yeah. saying the, cli the client doesn't know. The client is trying to ignore the issue. You got an appointment because obviously on a scale of one to 10, it's a four. But who wants to pay 
top dollar and, and get through that fear of change on a four out of 10. Mm -hmm. You gotta move it up. And it isn't by how well we talk about the solution. I, it still gets to me that features and benefits, features and benefits, <laughs> I wish people would understand that, you know, in its time we'll get there, but that should be the easiest part. Digging in and asking questions that you're going to have to think of on the spot to go deeper, that's the hard part. And then the other part is, and also to realize that uh, you bring a lot of uh, great value to the conversation because you know, you probably work with their competitors. Maybe you work with other people in their industry. Maybe you've come across this exact uh, uh, you know, problem in another place, uh, almost the same. And you can give so that they, you can share this information with them. Now, that's something of value because I know, right, Rob, you're coming to see me. I know you're a salesperson already, so you don't have to pretend you're not a salesperson. What I want to know is how you've done this before, how you've done this in a situation like mine before. What, what experience can you bring to bear uh, that can actually help me in this situation, help me make better decisions. Yeah, you're right. You know, in the end, you're going to have to feel comfortable with me. You're going to have mm -hmm. to trust me. And and I keep going back to the same thing, actually. I, I think it's going to be you know, <laughs> on my tombstone. <laughs> Ask questions and listen. You know, yeah. Rob Jollis, have a nice life, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Go Nats. But, but um, <laughs> truly, when you do that, you know, everyone, this isn't Rubik's Cube. Mm -hmm. I keep saying it, the more the customer talks, the more they're going to like you. So it's okay to be smart, okay? But you, you want to be smart, feed the questions to the customer. Uh, you don't have to tell, don't have to demonstrate how smart you are. They're going to think mm -hmm. of you as plenty smart and plenty, plenty trustworthy if you let them paint the picture. If you let them um, you know, really kind of solve this issue, you are a therapist. Uh, mm -hmm. let them talk and let them discover this. And if you do, I don't think you're going to get hammered with, well, but you're still 3% higher than this other mm -hmm. vendor I have no relationship with. Uh, yeah. In the absence of value, price is always the most important criteria. Yeah. We know that. And just like a therapist, take notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and the funny thing is, John, And then put them, into your, put them into your CRM. Yeah. And sometimes I have to tell you, it's, you know, truth be told, Sometimes I'm taking notes that aren't that important for me, <laughs> but it's important for the customer. It is. They'll actually, once they see me taking notes, they're going, what other thing? We do this and this and this. Now mm -hmm. in my head, I'm thinking completely irrelevant, but why would I go, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. No, that's no. going down. Believe me, exactly. I'm taking notes for you and me. Yeah, and that way, uh, yeah, at the end of the conversation or later, I can say, okay, just to recap, and I just want to make sure that I got all of this correctly. Uh, not only is that a trust building, confidence building, it's a respect thing too, because there's nothing it. like, because at the end of the day, I mean, if we come to the end of our conversation and then you feel like, oh my goodness, he didn't really listen to anything I had to say. He wasn't really that engaged or whatever. It's not going to be, not going to be a great conversation, is it? That's, yeah, really well said. That, that's the thing. I didn't want to be even disrespectful of that comment of I'm writing things down that aren't important, but there's certain yeah. things we're looking for and there's certain things the customer is saying that, aren't as relevant, but if it's important to them, at least do them the courtesy of demonstrating that you're listening and you're valuing it. And who knows, it may very well come back to be an important piece of criteria. But I, I just don't want everyone to think, well, why would I write it down if I don't need it? It's not about you, it's about them. <laughs> Exactly. And it's a perfect way to uh, end the conversation. Uh, it's about, it's not about you. It's about them. Um, Rob, as usual, just before you go, just let everybody know where they can find out more about you and what you're doing these days. Pretty simple. J-O-L-L-E-S.com. And you'll see me and you'll see the articles I write every two weeks. Not a blog, not an article, a article. Uh, and, uh, and go Nats. Let's go. It's been since yeah. 1933 since we've been there. 1927, I believe, since we've won it. Why not us this time? Exactly. Why not? And it just shows you, uh, you know, every, every underdog has its day, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.